our president's not doing that. You're not safe in our hometown in New Orleans. You're not safe in Chicago. You're not safe in New York. I feel way more unsafe in the United States than I do in El Salvador. And I felt that way before the exception rule went in. Why? The beaches are all safe. You want to learn about this place? Come down to Bitcoin Beach and meet the people. Come to Hope House and talk to them. Come to a Bitcoin meeting here. Go and see the, the guy who plays the crazy music that has the fruit truck come out and tell me that that guy is a bad hombre. Tell me these people do not want to help you. These people are fabulous people, but they're better neighbors. I love them. We're live here today with Dr. Jack. Um, super excited to dive into a little bit of your history because I've heard bits and pieces, so I want to kind of put it all together. Uh, before that, I just want to thank Roman or Chimbera, as you guys know, for uh, covering the, the podcast for the last three weeks. Uh, he did an amazing job. I think maybe uh, people will want him to replace me, so I'll have to make sure I, I don't leave for too long. Uh, he looked very comfortable in that seat, but he did an amazing job. So uh, thank you, Roman. So Jack, I get a sense that you um, have a much bigger following than even I realize. I've heard kind of bits and pieces. I've heard your names different places, but as I start preparing for this podcast, uh, I mean, it's like you're some kind of cult leader or something. You have these these fanatics that are just rave about, you know, how you've kind of transformed their lives with their understanding of how to um, change things that, you know, about their health. So give the, the listeners just a little bit of background of how you became this kind of health guru. Well, I'm a neurosurgeon in the United States. Uh, I also have house here in El Salvador. Uh, Actually, it's a piece of land right now that's being built, but I bought that uh, before legal tender law was here. And the story for me is I realized that most of biology about 15, 20 years ago comes down to circadian biology. That, that process began with me uh, as a neurosurgeon. I worked at night under blue light all the time. And after residency, I got really big. I was up to about 360 pounds. And I went to my primary care doctor and said, look, I need to lose weight. You know, I don't want to turn into Steve Jobs and be dead by the time I'm 40. And he told me exercise more, eat less. I did that and I gained 30 pounds. So it didn't work. So the whole calories in, calories out then didn't work. So at that time, I invented some minimally invasive spine surgery instruments. And I was given a talk down in Birmingham, Alabama at the behest of a centralized company. And when I stood up to give the talk, I felt the horrible pain in my right knee and I needed help to get to the podium. Long story short, orthopedic surgeons were also there diagnosing me as having a torn knee meniscus. And I'm like, how the hell did I tear my knee meniscus just by standing up? So one of the ladies that was there said, look, my husband says you're a really smart guy. She goes, I work in big pharma. I'm going to send you a book and six papers. I can tell you exactly why this happened. So she sent me this book. Uh, she told me to read the book first and then the six papers, and I did that. And what she was trying to tell me, because I've talked to her subsequent to this, is that she wanted me to out Big Pharma um, because she knew that I had the goods from my, my background to do something like that. And I wasn't interested really in doing that. I took the whole idea a different way. I said, is what's in this book possible? Because this book, the name of it is The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, written by Robin Sharma. It's a fable. It's not true. It's a very interesting story of, you know, a guy who's a lawyer in New York is in the courtroom fighting a case. This guy's known as an asshole. He's fat. He's thin, you know, classic New York City lawyer. He has a heart attack in the courtroom. And long story short, he decides to change his life, sells his Ferrari, gets out of New York, goes to the top of the Himalayan mountains, comes back in a year, tan, 100 pounds less, and he's a nice guy. And I was fascinated 
by this story. Why? Because I am from New York. I was a fat ass and I was an asshole. And I was like, is this actually physically possible? So uh, when I went to see the orthopedic surgeon back home, they wanted to do surgery, obviously, right away. Me being a surgeon, I knew the literature better than they did, that there's really no role for surgery with meniscal tears. I said, I'm going to try something different. So I went to the medical school library at, at Vanderbilt and studied for 18 months. And I said, there's got to be another answer. You know, you know, this famous guy, you've probably heard of Einstein. He said, if you keep doing the same shit over and over again, you expect a different result. Well, that's the story of centralized medicine with obesity and why we have an obesity crisis in the United States. So after reading the book, one of the things that struck me is Sharma wrote in there that a human life, you get to see 25,000 sunrises. And I thought to myself, how many sunrises have you really seen, Jack, in your life? And the answer was less than 40 because I was a dentist, I was an oral surgeon, I was a neurosurgeon, I had a medical license, a dental license. Dude, I got more schooling than you could ever imagine. So you were a dentist before you oh, became yeah. a surgeon? Absolutely. I was a dentist and an oral surgeon, oral surgery residency, then got my MD degree, and then went back and did neurosurgery. So I've been in a, through a lot of circadian disruption. And I actually thought about this whole issue. The, thing, the key issue in that book that really started this path was the 25,000 sunrises in a life. Then I thought about the implications of what else was in the book. He left high latitude New York, went to top of the mountain, which was 29,000 feet, met a bunch of monks who were all tan. He got tan. I said, that makes sense because at altitude, you're going to get more UV light, even though it's high latitude. And then it was cold. I said, man, that's kind of interesting. I got to figure that part out. So these are all the thermodynamic variables that I had in my head when I read this book. Then I read the papers. The papers were scientific papers. They're all about a hormone named leptin. Leptin was discovered in 1994. I graduated medical school in 93. So obviously I didn't learn about it. I didn't learn anything about a residency either. And then I found out the story about leptin. It's a hormone that's in your fat, gets secreted, goes to a part of your brain where the energy accountant is located. That energy accountant turns out to be leptin. So if you think about this from a Bitcoin standpoint, it's kind of, you're starting to see this algorithm, you know, come to fruition in front of your eyes. So I went back in the neurosurgery books to look for this leptin pathway. And I, I couldn't find anything in the old books. But in the new books, I started to find out how leptin was linked to these other things in the body. And lo and behold, in one of the books, I found this pathway called the leptin melanocortin pathway. And I read a little bit about it. And when I started to read about it, um, I started to realize this was a bigger story than even I thought. Um, and it turns out this chemical that leptin, uh, I should say that melanin comes from, is a gene in our body. And it's a very unusual gene. All mammals have it. It's called POMC, pro-opial melanocortin. And it turns out what translates this gene, in other words, makes it uh, come to fruition in your body, UV light. And you know that centralized doctors always tell you that UV light's toxic for you. And I was like, well, that's a paradox. Uh, why would God or evolution put a gene on us if UV light in the sun is toxic? So that really perplexed me. And uh, I thought about that further. And then I found out that this chemical breaks down or the gene breaks down to six different things. I looked up what each one did and then I went down that rabbit hole. So I got all this information and what did I find out? That the leptin melanocortin pathway is in every single mammal that's on this planet. So I grew up in New York City. And when I was a, a young kid, I was poor. Uh, my family was on welfare because my mom and dad broke up. So I used to go to the museum almost every day. My mom would give me a dollar to get on the subway to go there. And I would give a donation because at that time they only asked for donations to get in. So I used to give one cent. But I'd follow all the rich kids around with the ladies that took you to all the places. And I learned all these interesting facts. One of the facts that I was fascinated by is mammals came on this planet 300 million years ago. But they didn't radiate everywhere until 65 million years ago when an asteroid hit pretty damn close to where we are right now at 20 north latitude at the Yucatan Peninsula. And at that time, 
30 miles of the earth got blown up in the air. Photosynthesis got blocked for a period of time. And one of the crazy things is geologists today now know there's something called the KT boundary. You can't find a dinosaur skeleton above that boundary. So dinosaurs got taken out. Who took over? Mammals. And that's when I started to think about the story that I just told you about in the book and the things. I'm like, I know this has to be related in some way, but I didn't know how. So here I am, a 360 pound fat ass putting off, you know, surgery. And I go to Florence, Italy with my family and I'm standing at the foot of Michelangelo's David. And I look up at David and I said, 500 years ago, that was perfection. Look at me, it's my fat ass. I'm like, what's the difference? And at that time, the eureka moment for me was, if you've ever been to Florence, you know that the, it's in a cupola that has windows in it. A shot of light comes through, hits David, and on the ledge, there's a bird sitting there. And immediately I knew what the link was. I was like, oh shit. The leptin melanocorn pathways, all about the two animals that got through the last extinction event, eutherian mammals and theropod dinosaurs. Because when I was a little kid, I learned about theropod dinosaurs. They're birds. They became birds. We know that through their hip joint. The most famous bird is right in the Hall of Mammals and Dinosaurs where they meet in the Museum of Natural History in New York. It's called the Archaeopteryx. When my kid was in third grade, I taught him that because I remember learning it in third grade, never realized how important it was going to be to the genesis of decentralized medicine. And it turns out that was the, the seminal moment. So I got on the Delta flight the next day, used all the napkins around, and I started putting all these different ideas down, 30 different ideas. I called it a levy. Why? Because I went to medical school in LSU. <clears throat> Levies protect the city from hurricanes. So I wrote, wrote all these down, and I started to lay this whole thing out. And I realized that the key was the thermal dynamics of cells. It was the physics of organisms that really mattered. And it turned out the things that were the most important were three things, light, water, and magnetism. And the things that centralized doctors learn is diet and exercise. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense because that story is not there. So I started parsing it and taking it all apart. And I realized that the food story actually was a light story at its core. It was also a water story at its core. It was also a magnetic story at its core. And I didn't realize that when I was in medical school. Why? You know that in third grade, you learned about photosynthesis. Sunlight, CO2 plus water gives you sugar. Every plant in El Salvador does this. It's all around us. You know, you know, down here you can pee on the ground and make a coconut tree. So I realized right then and there that food really was a light water magnetism story. And then I also realized something more profound about food is that the magnetic effect is found in the free radical signal of the food, actually, food is an electromagnetic barcode of where the earth and the sun is in relation to each other. So that's why it makes no sense to eat a coconut from El Salvador in Boston on December 31st. Why? Because coconuts don't grow in Boston. So nature says it can't happen. But Mike, you and I are both Americans, and we know that Whole Foods has coconuts in Boston on December 31st. But when you eat them, you create a signal in your mitochondria that there's a problem. In other words, it's a mismatch with nature. It's like, to, to, to explain it to a Bitcoiner, it's like all of a sudden in your wallet, Ethereum showed up. You got shit coins and we don't want that. Um, so from that standpoint, I took it. Um, one of the, the way that the real story kind of started for me I had a gastroenterologist in my hospital. So I, I came up with something called a leptin prescription. I decided to do what Amgen didn't want anybody to know. I decided to come up with a prescription that uses UV light, infrared A light, and cold to lose weight. So I used to be a real big fat ass. And in seven months, I lost 100, 111 pounds. Then I lost another 33 for a total of about 150 pounds. And this happened in 11 months. So of course, everybody saw me in the hospital and they're like, dude, did you have surgery? I said, well, how can I have surgery? I never missed any time. I've been here for 11 months. You guys all saw me. So this gastroenterologist 
who's a good friend of mine, I told him the whole story. And he goes, dude, this is incredible. He goes, you need to write this shit down. He goes, but you can't submit it to a journal because if you do, they're going to come after you. Why? Because centralized institutions do not want this kind of information out because if you solve someone's problem without drugs, basically they don't have any customers. That's the whole point of a centralized system. So that's where my decentralized idea came from, from that discussion with that gastroenterologist. So what did I do, Mike? Put the information on the internet for free. Just laid it out there. And um, so, so going back to, so you said you lost 100 pounds or 150 100, pounds? 100, close to 150 pounds. Okay. And that was no diet or exercise change? It was? No, there was a diet change. The diet change was, a, I ate like a great white shark and lived like a polar bear. So I ate nothing but protein and fat, animal foods, hardly any plants at mm -hmm. all. And I submerged myself in freezing cold water. The water I found out through process of elimination, the best was 50 to 55 degrees. I didn't have to go really cold. Just so you know, in this process, did I go to the Bering Straits and swim in 28 degree water with no wetsuit? I did, and I stayed in for 45 minutes to the disbelief of the people in Alaska to prove a point. And this was the point that I want everybody to hear. If Weddell seals and polar bears can do it, and they're both mammals, why can't we? So it turns out we can, but we don't know how because we have all these bullshit ideas from centralized people. All polar bears are fat. Polar bears have thick skin. Weddell seals have special abilities. And guess what, Mike? That's all bullshit too because they don't understand the physics of organisms. So Uncle Jack did it. And my most famous story is when I was with my ex-wife in Nashville, I had her pack me in 200 pounds of ice in our bathtub. There's a picture somewhere on the internet of this. And I lost, I fell asleep in the ice and lost five pounds that night. And she was pissed off at me because she thought I was going to drown, but it had a huge impact on me. So, so explain to me how, and obviously the, the cold plunges or cold baths or something that's very big right now, especially in, in the Bitcoin space, but in the health space in general. But wasn't I, big 20 years ago when I came up with it. Just so you know, I came up with the cold thermogenesis protocol before Wim Hof, anybody knew his name, before cool sculpting in the United States got a patent. That happened in 2008. This was in 2003. But explain to me what, What's going on there? Like, why Why is that? You, how old are you? I am 48. Did you ever have a chance to get on the Concorde? No. All right, I'm going to tell you a little story about the Concorde. Then you'll understand how this works. The Concorde used to be on Heathrow or JFK, and it would leak gasoline out the wings on the ground. Why? Because the airplane was thermally inefficient. But when the plane took off, as soon as it got to 40,000 feet, it was freezing cold. Everything changed, and it got to Europe like this really fast. The reason why, there's a theorem in physics called Carnot's theorem. Carnot's theorem says that any big temperature differential change, you become more thermally efficient. And I knew that from being a little boy. So what was the idea that I had? Our mitochondria, which is the powerhouse in a cell, like the jet engine on the plane, I said, if I can create a huge temperature differential, I should be able to make my cells thermally more efficient to be able to burn fat at a higher rate. And that's exactly what I did. And that procedure is called the leptin prescription. That's actually how leptin works. Why? Because as I told you in the intro, leptin is a hormone that's made in your subcutaneous fat. And it's broken down, and that signal goes to a part of your brain called the hypothalamus, okay? That's like the algorithm of Bitcoin. That's the proof of work that's tied to this. So when you begin to turn fat burning on and you make yourself more thermally efficient, what happens? You can actually burn fat at a higher, faster rate. It has nothing to do with calories. It has absolutely everything to do with the environment. And I tell people this all the time. Like there's a famous guy in Bitcoin circles that you probably know if I get in fights with them all the time on Clubhouse, his name is American Hoddle. And Hoddle's always saying it's always calories in, calories out. Calories in, calories out only works for closed thermodynamic systems. Me and you and the guys on the board here, we're open thermodynamic systems. 
are always out in the environment. So that's why you can't use calories as a measure. Thermodynamics says that's not true. And it turns out leptin is proof positive that that's the case. Well, leptin is the beginning part of the story. There's this pathway that I told you about that has a big connection. It turns out that connection is big in the skin, which I'm sure you're figuring out now because humans, unlike most other mammals, can tend to keep their fat underneath their skin. But what else is the skin open to? Sunlight, okay? So we have an optical density and sun plays a big role there. What else plays a big role? Your eye. You get to see light through your eye. So the signal of light has to marry to temperature. What are the two main mechanisms of circadian biology that control the clock timing mechanism in us? Temperature and light. Hmm, kind of interesting, huh? So what, just out of curiosity for, for myself, um, you know, this, this past few years since we started Bitcoin Beach, uh, my, my health has actually deteriorated because before that I was out surfing, I was getting a lot of time in the sun, getting a lot more exercise. Um, and since then, just busy with travel and responding to emails and up all night on screens and doing that kind of stuff. And totally so I've understand. seen, you know, I've, I've probably gained 30, 40 pounds. I, I just, I feel like crap all the time because I don't have, you know, I don't have the energy that I had before. You know, part of it's I'm getting older, I'm sure, but part of it's I can just tell that, okay, I need to make some lifestyle changes. And so just on like a practical level for somebody like me, what, what would you recommend? Like these are the things that, Stop the that you need to do. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not kidding it. I would tell you, turn it over to Chambura. You said it in the beginning of this. Get back in as a surfer. Yeah. And do that constantly. Come back and be tan. Be tan like Paco. The other two people that are back here. I mean, look at me. I'm a gringo from this latitude. Look at me. Yeah. I mean, 59th latitude is where my people come from. And the thing is, this is the beautiful part of El Salvador. El Salvador can maximize two legs of that. Magnetism and light. We haven't talked about the magnetism part, but you don't realize the black sand of Bitcoin Beach has another benefit. That is volcanic. Volcanism, remember, is metal that used to flow. These, these uh, mountains are lava tubes. The sand here has got huge amounts of electric energy in it. In fact, you know, because you live here, when the lightning hits, it re very rarely hits on the lava tubes. It always, almost always hits on the water. That makes this place very unusual. Why? There's so much net negative charge in the sand here. So what does that mean? If you take your shoes off and walk at the beach, you get more effects of grounding. You may not know about grounding, but that's the way you get free electrons. So I know you're you're talking about all these things in, in very scientific terms, but what I'm hearing is like hippie, you know. Uh, you shouldn't hear and, hippie. And, and, Walking on and the beach so, is not hippie. No, no, but I'm just I'm just being honest. I'm just saying like I'm trying to reconcile these these two things, um, and so that's that's why I'm just kind of fascinated by this. This concept. I see it in my own life. I see that when I'm out in the water, when I'm out walking on the beach, when I'm doing these things, I, I just feel much better. I'm much happier. I'm have more energy. Everything's going better. That's where the proof but, of work is. Yeah. That's so so is. I'm not a. On one hand, I'm a skeptic, but I'm but on the other hand, I I know the fruit of it. So I believe what you're saying. I'm just trying to understand the mechanism behind it. The mechanism is very simple. It goes back to Einstein. What do you win a Nobel Prize for? Photoelectric effect. How do you absorb light? You have to have electrons. You're the only um, primate on this planet as a silly talking monkey that has ecrine sweat glands on your feet. You know why? You're designed to make a connection with the earth. You know, back in the United States, can you buy leather shoes anymore? Only rubber. When you come down here, most of the guys that surf down here never have shoes on. That's the reason why they're all skinny. That's the reason why they're all tan. Because they get in the sun. They build their solar callus up. You become able to hold the charge. That's the whole point of not being white. It, you want to upregulate melanin because it holds the charge. But electrons allow you to absorb that light. Melanin does other things. It's not just the, that only story. What I'm basically telling you is that you have quantum batteries built into you through this light water magnetism. And what you're experiencing is what I experienced 20 years ago. It's a brownout. In fact, I just went through it myself. 
I, I gained probably 30, 35 pounds in the last three or four years. Why? I went back to work in trauma call to try to do something to save a bunch of money, not only for Bitcoin, but for other reasons tied to my business. I told all my members, I know I made a mistake doing it, but why is El Salvador the answer for decentralized medicine? Because where I live back home in New Orleans at the 28th latitude, I don't get as good light. And I certainly don't get it as good as I do at the 13th latitude. The water is better there, but I just recently found out there's a place in El Salvador that has good water. The magnetism here is off the chart. The reason why it's off the chart is because all the mountains here are made by volcanoes. Uh, and it turns out if you maximize your time in nature in El Salvador, you will stay away from doctors. Doesn't mean you're not going to break your leg, yeah. you know, when it's, you know, rocks on a Zonti and people are surfing. Doesn't mean you're not going to get in a car crash. The good news for that, that's what centralized medicine's good at. We're good at fixing, you know, acute trauma. You get a subdural, we do great at that. What we suck at is diabetes. We suck at hypertension. We suck at obesity. We certainly suck at the opiate crisis. Um, you know, autism, autoimmune diseases. I'm telling you, if you come to a place like this that's closer to where light, water, magnetism are optimized, you will do better. What's the ace in the hole for El Salvador? It also has decentralized Bitcoin. Prior to El Salvador, prior to Bitcoin, my nurse is in, in the studio. She'll tell you, where did I send everybody? Right where the asteroid hit in Mexico. Why? Because Mexico, most of you know, in the Yucatan doesn't have a volcano. It's in Mexico City. But what does it have? Where the asteroid hit, 166 mile holes in the ground. We found out from satellites at the base, there is a volcano. It's in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. But the interesting thing is, you know about those cenotes yeah. that are in land, right? Those cenotes are filtered rainwater for 65 million years. What is water? Water is a magnetic dipole. It acts just like lava. Guess what? It has a huge magnetic flux there too. Not as high as El Salvador, but it's good. But what's the real special thing that the Maya people knew about? The water there was somehow special. It turns out it's something called deuterium depleted water because the difference in the land up there than here, it hit calcium carbonate. And when calcium carbonate collects water, it forms holes in the ground. That's where all the water has been sitting since that asteroid hit. That's all the water that the people use there. Their water is substantially better than the water here uh, for that reason. That was the only reason that I pushed Mexico uh, over El Salvador. But I'm gonna, I, I've been telling my members at least for four or five years now that Bitcoin now trumps the good water of Mexico. If you're gonna come to a place for your health, it makes total sense to add the wealth part of it. Why? Because health and wealth are linked. I told you the story before we started recording about Steve Jobs. To me, it's the biggest epic fail in human history to do all the things that he did, have $9 billion and die at 56 years old from a retroperitoneal cancer that his business actually caused, which is why he wouldn't let his kids use his own devices. But he doesn't want that story to get out because that would blow the centralized business up. Um, down here, um, because we have light water magnetism and Bitcoin, and we have you know a president and an administration that wants to return freedom back to the people, uh, what am I trying to do? What is Uncle Jack trying to do? I'm trying to return health back to people without getting a wallet bob C to do it. It's very similar to what Jack Mahler without said. Without getting a what? A wallet bob C. What's a wallet bob C? Remittance payment. Ah. That's exactly what Jack Mahler's told people, you know, uh, when uh, legal tender status happened. You remember that story from the stage of Miami? He said people that work in the United States that send money back to El Salvador, sometimes they're getting popped 50%. What do you think it is when you go to the doctor back at home and you see me for these problems? You think I'm going to take care of you for free, Mike? No, you're going to get wallet bobsy. What if I can save you to wallet bobsy? The reason I say it to you and you laugh and you see I'm not laughing, dude, I'm dead serious about this. You can save people millions of dollars. Oh, I 100% believe. I, mean, I, want, I want you to understand why decentralization yeah. in medicine and biology is as big a story as Bitcoin is and why this country 
needs to do both. And is that part of what has driven you to, to locate here and to push people as you see this has the potential to be on the vanguard of that? Uh, you just hit a three-pointer from no net, straight in. Absolutely. It should be blatantly obvious. Yeah. This place is great. The people that live here don't even know what they have. And, you know, I remember Roman telling me the first time I met him, he said, Jack, we go every time to teach the kids at school about Bitcoin. Mike, you don't even realize I'm doing the same thing to you right now. You're learning about decentralized medicine. And it's the same process that you've supported down here at Bitcoin Beach. You're learning that there's another side of healthcare, another side of biology that you didn't know about. You would have never known about it if I hadn't been a Bitcoin, if you hadn't heard my name and why this crazy gringo is bringing all these people here. Uh, and it turns out the story really is a biology story. The Bitcoin for my members is an add-on effect, um, but it's a big one. It's a huge one. And um, I am 100, you will never find anybody more passionate about decentralization than me because I realized it ruined my medical education. It ruined my residency. It ruined the reasons that I wanted to become a doctor. It certainly you know, caused a huge problem in finances you know, with what we have to deal with back at home with inflation. Inflation is basically taxation without the approval of Congress. This is the same thing. I feel like centralized medicine is stealing time away from people by not telling them the truth. No, I mean, obviously the system is is incredibly broken. I mean, even prior to COVID, we see that, especially in the U.S., just with, uh, I mean, it's it's just insane the, the way it bankrupts people the, and the way our health keeps getting worse, the more money we spend on it. That, um, that's what we said earlier. Remember? Yeah. It's insanity. It's what Einstein said. If we keep doing the same thing over and over again, it's insanity. What's changed What's changed the uh, tune, so to speak? In, in Bitcoin, it was Mahler's and Bukele coming together. That changed the tune. I think what's going to happen in decentralized medicine, it's COVID that's changed it. Why? For what you just said. Now we're three years after COVID, we see the problems with it. We see the problems with what centralized science had, the problems with the vaccine, long COVID, people dying, people who have cancer now are dying at record rates who got the jab. The aftermarket data is undeniable now. But you have to remember, Mike, back three years ago or three and a half years ago when I first came to El Salvador, I was doing documentaries that had to be behind paywalls to warn people about what was coming. In fact, the guy... Uh, who cooked the steak for Chambora. Uh, he was one of the first people vaccinated in El Salvador. And I would I would hope someday you do a podcast with him because he has the most interesting El Salvadorian Bitcoin story because of how he interacted with me. Uh, I told him immediately what to do to avoid the problems. Um, the big issue is... The people in Central America, I'm not going to just throw El Salvador under the bus here. They believed centralized institutions. They believed the World Health Organization. They believed the CDC. They believed the FDA. There was pockets, uh, especially when Bukele came in, that he was understanding there was a thing to do. He knew immediately that keeping people inside was stupid. You know, I remember the little packs when I first came down here that they were giving away to Salvadorians about, you know, it had ivermectin in it. It had vitamin C, it had melatonin, you know, and there were stories out there that I saw even on social media that, you know, Bukele's administration is telling people, get outside. We're going to close the country down. Bitcoin Beach was devastated by this. Um, but I remember those stories and I thought to myself, this country is getting ready to decentralize and finance. They need to go the next step. They need to know the other part of the story. And I can't get on... Uh, the Bukele administration for this, because let's face it, you're learning about it or me four years later. Um, no one really knew. I remember four years ago when it came to COVID, I'm the crazy neurosurgeon, you know, who the FBI talked about, you know, because we were going to blow up a cruise ship, you know, who people saw me on Fox News or, you know, PETA was after me, you know, that kind of stuff. But the thing is, if you saw the documentary that I did, who did I do it with? Peter McCullough who's on Twitter, 
constantly talking about this problem. Yeah. Robert Malone, who has is a co-inventor of the patents. Okay, he even took the jab and has got complications from it. He was in the documentary. We were warning everybody that the architects of COVID, specifically the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, Fauci, Collins from the NIH, you know, just, I don't know, you said you've been away, you probably don't even know this week. In the United States, it's now been released by the NIH that Fauci and Collins made I think $352 million in 58 different royalty payments. This just wow. came to light. So when you stopped me before and you left, you said, what did you say, a wallet popsy? Dude, that's the biggest fucking wallet popsy that the American- I just never, I'd never heard that term before, so. Uh, I just want you uh, to know yeah. that, look, we've been lied to. Just like no, the central banks we've, lied to us. We've been lied to, but I'm, I'm curious as to, to your thoughts on what was driving, because most of the medical community bought into it, but even even the medical community that wasn't directly benefiting, I, I definitely think everybody that, was benefiting. That people, I mean, I hospitals were making unbelievable amounts of money. Look, Chantel's sitting here laughing. Just so you know, my I'm, I make my money do, by doing elective surgeries. Do you know what they? I, and just so. I want to be very clear about this because I know we have some Salvadorian people. In the United States, I'm the top of the pyramid. I make more money than any specialty in the United States. How do I make the most money? Operating on people. They stop me from operating on people. The hospital makes the most money from neurosurgery. They shut us down. Ask yourself why. Because you know why? Every person they admitted to the ICU, they made more money if they had the diagnosis of COVID-19 and who paid that bill? Not the American taxpayers are alive now, my great grandchildren. You know, you, we always talk about this in money and Bitcoin, but I want you to realize the most expensive thing in the world is not having your health. It's not even close. In the United States, it's the number one thing that bankrupts people. Um, the Croatian MP, I would like to take credit for this, but I can't, but this is such an epic statement, especially in this country. He was on Twitter the other day and he said, the irony of COVID is that the Colombian drug cartel was safer for the American public than centralized medicine was. And you wanna know, it sounds like a hyperbolic statement, but you wanna know what I did after that? I looked up how many people died from cocaine and fentanyl deaths through COVID, and it turns out the guy wasn't full of shit. It was safer to be under the auspices of a cartel. Think about that for a minute. Think about why we all need to think about change. It's huge. That's why I said it's a big story. But, but is, it, is it just some people at the top that are driven by financial gain? Because I- Mike, isn't that the story of Bitcoin? But but I, I can't believe you're asking. No, no. But I, I, I feel like there are a lot of people that genuinely bought into it. Like yeah, people that. There's lemmings everywhere. And it, it was, especially when it came to like, obviously the young kids were at almost zero risk of COVID. And they continued to push vaccinations on these young kids, even after they knew that they weren't working. But it was. They're still doing it, was, it today. It's, Just say no. But it's almost like, it's like a sickness. They they it's, can't. It's not a sickness. It's what the agenda is. You you need to understand. There's a big goal. But a lot of the people that are pushing that are not the ones that are personally benefiting. Oh yes, they are. The COVID. If you want to know what COVID really was, it was an economic test case, a compliance test for an economic reset. This absolutely is a Bitcoin story, and even Mike Peterson of Bitcoin Beach doesn't realize it. I told Jeremy that, I told Roman that, I've told other Bitcoiners that. Look, the way I met Jeremy Franco, my first El Salvadorian friend was on Clubhouse. When I was on Clubhouse, I was on Bitcoin Clubhouse, teaching people what I'm teaching you right now. These are hardcore Bitcoiners that own a lot of Bitcoin. Most of them own over 50 Bitcoin. These are all young kids that are pretty wealthy. And most of them rolled their sleeves up. And you know what I told them? I said, how can you be decentralized in your finance and centralized in your biology? I said, this is fundamentally incongruent. And some of them started waking up. And I said, do you realize 
who is benefiting from this? I said, every centralized institution out there, this bred the woke movement. It, it bred every single crazy movement in the United States. Why? What is the goal, Mike? The goal is to get a CBDC in the United States. And you know why you can't get a CBDC in the United States right now? Because the Fourth Amendment is a problem. So what do you do? You try to make sure that you have an obedient population. They do whatever they tell you. And then you elect presidents that set the Supreme Court up so that you're allowed to bypass the Fourth Amendment or change it. Now, this should resonate with every person who's Salvadoreno. Why? What did Bukele do when he come in? He changed the law. He got rid of the corrupt judges. And everybody who was woke, everybody who supported the centralized narrative in the United States, what did they call Bukele? A dictator. The last time I checked, when Washington came in, George Washington, he had to clear the deck of all the assholes from Britain. He did exactly the same thing. And I don't see anybody calling him an asshole or a dictator. Bukele has told people, we're going to do this our way. Well, guess what I'm telling people? You need to do it your way too when it comes to health. When the doctor tells you to roll up the sleeve, you have to be smart enough to know to ask some questions. But do you think that that individual doctor doesn't think that they're doing what's best for you? Some that's, of that's my question. Now, yes. Now pediatricians are injecting children with this and they know it's a problem. You know what the problem that you don't understand, Mike? And you're going to understand it when I'm done with you. When I started out in medicine, 1% of doctors, 1% were employees. Okay? Today, 99% of doctors are employees of what? healthcare, of hospitals. Mike, I work for myself. I don't give a flying fuck what those people say. Why? Because I'm working for you. I'm fully decentralized. Your doctor works for an employer. If you don't do what the employer says, Mike, do you know what happens? You get fired. You get canceled. Yeah. In this work up to this podcast, you heard the story how 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I was canceled. You want to know why I'm passionate about this? Now you know. They can't try to cancel me. And why didn't it work? Because I was fucking smarter than they are. I started to decentralize way earlier. I made another business so I didn't have to rely on the changes that were going through medicine to employ everybody. You want to know why people follow me, Mike? You're starting to feel me yet. That's the answer. So you think that the, the basically medicine becoming controlled by large healthcare organizations is, Huge problem. is the main driver of why. So they're basically, this is just, they're being told what to do. And Mike, they who's push the, it down who's, the line. Who's, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt you because I'm enjoying this. Who's the, the highest paid employee in the United States? Does anybody in the room know? I know you do. My nurse. Fauci. You got it. Fauci, he makes more than the president. So let me ask you something. Why are we paying an 80-year-old guy who lied to Rand Paul, our senator from Kentucky, about gain-of-function studies, that we were involved in it? Guess who was complicit in that? The NIH. Anybody in this room know what the NIH does? Controls all research in the United States for medicine. Mike, I'm popping your bubble. No, you're not popping my bubble. I'm just, I've always ascribed to the theory that, what is it, don't ascribe to malice what can be ascribed to stupidity. And I, but I'm, I, 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 I have a, a hard time with the, the broad conspiracy theories of all these things working together. And that's what I'm, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, well, then I, so that's I don't, what I'm I don't, I don't understand then how you, get the ethos of Bitcoin and don't see this right in front of you because it's exactly the same thing. No, no, I'm not saying that there's not conspiratorial people, but for it, the whole world to come together at one moment and all of those actors- But all the money is failing everywhere in the world simultaneously? You don't see how that's possible. Is that what you're saying? I, on, as far as on, on the healthcare side- It's it. a proxy for yeah. dollars, my friend. You're not seeing that. That's the, that's the leap you haven't made. That's what it's about. Remember, if they can get compliant idiots from controlling them, 
then they can switch your money out. They can do whatever they want. That's the whole point yeah. of CBDC. Look, how do you get people compliant? Make them sick. No, I agree with that. I agree that it's... Why would you ever try to heal them then? That's exactly what centralized systems do. Remember, what did I say earlier and you agreed with it? Well, if you cure somebody, you don't have a customer, do you? Yeah. No, the incentives definitely are not properly aligned. Ask yourself why. Yeah. Like this is the exercise that I'm glad we're having this discussion, especially live, because if, if this has happened to Mike Peterson, I guarantee you there's a lot of other people in Bitcoin that need to hear this. And just so you know, because I want to be clear about this, probably the, the biggest Bitcoiner out there who's really supported it is Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey is a huge Bitcoin. Jack Dorsey is one of my followers. He's one of my cult people that you called. You remember in, in Bitcoin Miami when he came out on the stage? Roman was there and he had the tie-dye uh, shirt on. That shirt was at the sun. And you know who made that shirt? Rick Rubin's son. What's his name? Ra. Why is he named Ra? Sun god of Egypt. So my cult members seem to understand nature pretty good. They also understand Bitcoin pretty good. Yeah. There's a reason why guys who are big Bitcoiners are also decentralized in their biology because they don't want to wind up like Steve Jobs. They don't want to wind up like the things that you just said are going on with you. What I'm trying to explain to you, Mike, is that when you really truly do understand this, you're going to be back surfing. Roman's going to be doing this podcast. He's going to try to find somebody else who's younger to do the podcast <laughs> because he's listening to this podcast. And you know what? We're all going to laugh about it. But I'm telling you the truth. Everything that Jack Cruz believes isn't my theory. Everything that I believe is a law of nature. Like the photoelectric effect equals MC squared. Those aren't subject to your opinion, my opinion, or Dr. Fauci's opinion. They are true here in El Salvador, in New York City, on Andromeda, in Jupiter, anywhere in the cosmos. And the thing is, you have to bring the story to people of how it works. Because as you said, it's hard to fathom that this is really what's going on. And it is. That's the reason why Bill Gates is blocking the sun. It's the reason why he's buying up farmland. These things all fit. They are trying to control things. I told you before we started that the, the Bukele administration is interested in the displaced farmers, you know, in Europe. Why, why is the government of the EU taking farmland away? It's a story about money, dude. It's there. What? Their currency is failing. What, what did we hear about today or two days ago? Guy in Ecuador who actually was favorable to Bitcoin got killed. Okay, now we have the guy leading in Argentina who their central bank just put their rate top rate at 118 percent to stop hyperinflation. He now is leading and the media can't believe it. Sounds like a Bukele story to me. Yeah. They always like to label them far right, far right. And exactly. Always, uh, yeah. That's but their that, go to. The point that I'm trying to say to you is nature is based on fractal biology. And what am I pointing out? So is Bitcoin. That's what's happening in every country. You guys live, or I should say, I'm included me in this now. We live in a place that's trying to deconstruct the centralized world. That's what makes Bukele the enemy. I'm going to tell you that I've been the enemy of centralized medicine. Big Pharma doesn't want this truth coming so out. So how have you kept your licenses through this? this Very carefully. <laughs> I, I, I will tell you that um, I just told this story to Tom and Linda, who were on your podcast with Chimbora. Um, I'm sorry, Tom and Nancy, I apologize. Um, I had the most amazing time when I got my Mississippi license. I got summoned to the Mississippi State Medical Board, and I was like stunned. I'm like, I've never had to do that before. And they asked me... Um, Look, we looked at your record and we noticed that you're a neurosurgeon. You've never been sued. You don't have any settlements against you. And we brought you down here because we want to know, would you teach some of the other neurosurgeons kind of what you're doing? And I laughed at them. I said, no, I can't. Why? Because they're all centralized. I said, if I told them about decentralized medicine, they would have to stop doing some of the things they're doing that goes against what they learned in residency. 
But Mike, just so you know, neurosurgeons get sued more than any doctor in the United States. They average three lawsuits a year. I've been doing this for 30 years. Am I doing something right? That there's, therein lies the case. Decentralization in everything in your life should be something we all strive for. I'm okay. I don't want anybody to listen to this podcast and believe a damn word I said. I want you to fact check me, just like Bitcoiners tell. Trust, but verify. I want you to do the same thing with me. But why do I have a smile on my face now? Because I know I'm right. Because if I'm wrong, so is Einstein, so is fucking nature, so is E equals MC squared. I got good company. I'm okay on that side of the ledger. But the question you got to ask yourself is, Mike, what if you're wrong? What if your guy on your team is Steve Jobs or Paul Allen? Might that bother you a little bit? Might you say, God, all this cool work that I've done in El Zante, all this podcast, that's awesome. All the great things that people know that you've done. You don't want that to be your legacy to be dead. I, I want to see you back surfing with that dude on that little boogie board who I watch at Old DeMare all the time. That guy's freaking amazing. <laughs> he, he is amazing. He, he's uh, it's so I, it's hard to just believe he's how over he's 50 surfing. years old. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm he like, he's already a Jack rips. Cruz member. I may have to give him <laughs> membership in the cult just for being that dude. So are you planning on being here full time or and are you you bringing all your uh, members here? Have you seen a lot of them already moving to El Salvador or what's like, what's your vision for El Salvador? Uh, if I could move the whole United States down there, I would. But the problem is there's not enough land. Um, but no, the truth is I, I've been pushing El Salvador for four years. Uh, your last podcast. Um, yeah, I know. They, they basically they, came here because of you. Right. Is there a number of other people that yeah. are on that same path? Well, or? just so you know, I've been here for three weeks after doing a, um, a tour up in, in the high latitudes, Norway, Iceland, and places that I want to keep people away from. Um, I flipped a guy named Dave Herrera. Uh, he is a Mexican guy who actually is a contractor. Uh, he was going to go buy a house in Utah. As of a week ago, he got his wife changed. I did a six hour consult with him in my pool at Chalpa. And his wife agreed he's now coming here. I have Joel Marquez and Diana that I hope that you guys have on the podcast. They live in San Blas. They moved here about four or five months ago. And they already have uh, their stuff set. Joel speaks Spanish. They're going to have the first uh, bilingual um, homeschool program in El Salvador, and that's going to be open. And the reason that Dave Herrera is going to come because he has four kids. And guess what? I hooked him up with Joel and Sam Blast, and that was the clincher for his wife. Yeah. Schooling for people that are moving, that's always a challenging thing. Well, Joel came down. There's a picture on Twitter that you can find from my lawyer, Eduardo Aguilar in San Salvador, where he got all their paperwork. They're officially up and running. They're taking enrollments in. Uh, they're definitely two people that I hope, you know, you reach out to and bring in because they're interesting. Um, there's uh, another guy. That's, just, just Andy, can you note that down so that we can have them on? Um, another guy named Matt, who's an electrical engineer. Uh, he's here right now. He told me yesterday during my Q&A that he's now scouting an area. We told him about the place that we went up in Metapan. Uh, so he wants to go. Um, there's plenty of people. I've got Brandon who's here with his son. Brandon came from Idaho. He lives full-time in Chalpa. Uh, he's an electrical engineer, still works in the United States, but he does it remotely because of COVID. His son is 19 years old and he's um, in flight school in Ilopango, learning to be a helicopter pilot. Really? And their goal is to build an airport, not commercial, but an airport for smaller people so that we can take helicopters to go up to the top of mountains to find waterfalls to live the lifestyle that we're living. And it turns out the place that I found already has uh, a place that's ready to do that. So what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that I stole the idea of Mahatma Gandhi. Instead of bitching and moaning about your life, become the change you want to see in the world. So I've decided that the best place to be in the world is right here in El Salvador. Why? Um, 
I can say this to you as an American and probably not get in trouble. Americans believe that we are defined by our border. And it turns out, if you read the Constitution, the Constitution is an idea. That idea can be usurped and used in any other country. And Bukele got that message a long time ago. And he's decided to bring life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness back to his tribe. He started out, I don't want to call him a bad hombre, but he's a communist. And he said, this is not working. And then he changed his mind. It, it's the mark of an educated mind to take something you fundamentally don't believe and change it. But Kelly's already examined and did that. What did he decide to do? He was with one party and then the parties turned on him. So what did he do? He did the most amazing thing ever. He made his own party. And then he had to get a couple hundred thousand signatures in what, 18 hours? And everybody said he couldn't do it, and he did it. Like, he doesn't worry about what people tell him he can't do. He just keeps doing. Well, guess what? The people in America who are going to come here are just like the pilgrims that came to the 13 colonies. It's not going to be easy when they get here. There's going to be problems. But I can tell you this, when you breathe the air here, you see the smiling Salvadorino faces. And when they try to help you, you're going to feel a whole lot different than you do in downtown Chicago when you have to wear a Kevlar vest. That I can tell you. And have you felt that being here? Like, have you seen a change in your own? I just I just had a discussion in Ola de Mer um, with the new architect and new builder. And they try to convince me that I need somebody to live on my property, have barbed wire on the top. And finally, one of them admitted to me, Doc, the reason why we believe, oh, alarm systems, let me add that in. He said, the reason why we believe this, we just came through a civil war. You know, Salvadorinos are still scarred by this. I said, dude, I live in a Tommy. There's a freaking gate. I said, I want my neighbors to come over. I don't want to put barbed wire yeah. on my freaking fence. I don't want- like, It's a we, mindset though. They well, definitely well, still have Chantel that and I are in mentality. A, we're in an Airbnb in shop. I'll tell you one of the things that I know she hates. They have a freaking camera right on us. They have an outside shower. You used to have one in this place here. Hopefully you still have it. We used to like to take showers out there naked. Well, we do that now. There's a damn camera pointed right at us that the two people that are in the house on the top, they're the gatekeepers. And Chantal says, I don't give a shit. But the point I'm trying to make to you, why am I telling you this? This country has a president that put all the bad hombres away. And he's continuing to do that. Our president's not doing that. You're not safe in our hometown in New Orleans. You're not safe in Chicago. You're not safe in New York. I, I told my architect, I said, I feel way more unsafe in the United States than I do in El Salvador. And I felt that way before the exception rule went in. Why? The beaches are all safe. I, don't, I can't speak about San Salvador. I've been in San Salvador enough. The only place that I think I see more barbed wire is all the places around the United States Embassy. And I found out yesterday the reason why. Apparently, all the people that work in the embassy have to put barbed wire around their fence because of what the State Department says about Salvador, which to me is pathetic. And anybody who goes and reads the U.S. State Department about El Salvador now and believes it, they're out of their freaking mind. That is all centralized bullshit. I, I tell everybody on Clubhouse, tell everybody on Twitter, you want to learn about this place? Come down to Bitcoin Beach and meet the people. Come to Hope House and talk to them. Come to a Bitcoin meeting here. Go and see the, the guy who plays the crazy music that has the fruit truck come out and tell me that that guy is a bad hombre. Tell me these people do not want to help you. These people are fabulous people, but they're better neighbors. I love them. Yeah, I think, I don't know if they still require it, but I know, you know, a couple of years ago for the U.S. Embassy to, because they rent all those houses for the, the people. But in order to qualify, you had to have a panic room also in, in the, 
the property. So and 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 a lot of the embassy people aren't allowed to visit a lot of places in El Salvador. They have you know my wife we know, we has know friends that. at the embassy and they're like, oh, we can't, we're not allowed to go there. She's like, what do you mean? They're like, oh, we're that's not in the zone where we're allowed. Believe to it go, or not, so. we have we have some personal uh, information that we know that to be true. I can't talk about that, but we have family members that work in the government that are not allowed to travel to certain places because of their employment. Again, another centralized idea. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but it's out there. And I, I think that's what my argument is to people. If you want freedom, freedom is here, okay? And I, t I try to tell Americans this all the time. How do you think it was, Mike, to be in the United States, be black in the South 25 years after the Civil War in the United States? You think that those black people were welcome in Atlanta? Do you think that they didn't think they needed guns and protection? So you guys are 25 years after your civil war here. I think you're doing way better than we were. And you know what the ultimate irony was? Can you imagine owning, say, Peachtree Street in Atlanta, Georgia in 1890, what it would be worth today? There's the Bitcoin story. Can you imagine what it would be like to own a piece of Bitcoin Beach. I mean, Mike stole my house. He's, we're actually <laughs> recording in the house that I was going to buy. And we were talking about that. But the point is that there's still more. There's plenty more for people to come down. There's other parts of the country to go visit. Don't just stay at Bitcoin Beach. Yeah. Go see the lakes. Go well, I see. I think we have some we have some pictures, Andy, to throw up of, uh, I don't know if we put them up earlier, but but yeah, I agree with you. The beaches are amazing, but also the lakes, the mountains. I mean, the weather is just amazing. Well, we probably should talk about the weather because uh, I just came back from, uh, that's the place. This is called Brunate. It's outside a place, Metapan. It's about two and a half hours outside of, uh, it took us two and a half hours from Shopa to get there. But this place is a coffee plantation. And uh, the gentleman that owns his name is Giancarlo Rusconi. His dad bought it. He's a lawyer. He owns two mountains up there. This waterfall is 8,000 feet tall, and it's in between these two mountains. And this is actual geothermal water. It's not rainwater. It's being pumped out of the mountain from the volcano. So I'm having this water tested because this is the mountain that Jack Mahler has talked about in Miami. He said he would die on this mountain. I think that Uncle Jack found the mountain in El Salvador that we need. And you can see that's Jeremy Franco with his thumb up. He's the Salvador Salvadorian um, and Chantel and my other member. But we went in that and this water mic, just, you know, 50 degrees. Amazing. And uh, Giancarlo made us all go touch the, the rock in the back. They call it the mother rock because you have to get back there so you get some grounding. So the grounding effect was also there. And it was a beautiful sunny day. But... The thing is, this place is amazing. This is the first decentralized hospital in El Salvador, just so you know that. This is Victor, his caretaker. There's another property that they're building right now, another cabin, and this is the cool part. This is so high up, so you can imagine you can't get building materials up there. So his dad, Giancarlo's dad, when they cut the road to go up with a caterpillar to get up there, because the first six years they owned the place, they had to use donkeys to get up there. The government made him reforest half of the mountain. So what did they reforest with? Cedar. So the whole half of the mountain is covered with cedar that's been growing since 1997. So now they're building all the buildings with cedar. So can you imagine 70 degrees? It was 92 degrees at the base. 70 degrees. No place has... But it, it doesn't get very cold at night either. No. You have this like between 50 degrees and 70 degrees. It is amazing. Yeah. No AC needed in El Salvador, if anybody can believe that. But Victor is laying out the new flat property where this is all going to be grass. This is how you make grass at 8,000 feet in El Salvador. That's how you do it. And you use the mountain water to do it. And Victor got his first $100 of Bitcoin from me through Strike. I got him to download the Strike app. You can see that picture there. And this happened literally two days ago. And I asked Victor and Gian Caller about the local people in this area. And not too many people have got to them because they're so remote to talk to them about Bitcoin. So I explained to him the story about Martha Graham and Picasso. 
and that how any Bitcoin that he has has to be treated like the first Picasso that Martha Graham bought. And he said, tell me the story. I didn't know about it. I said, well, Martha Graham went to Paris in 1890 to 1905. Her brother bought a lot of Monet's and Matisse. He was paying 40, 50 bucks. Picasso at that time was in Paris, just came through his original period, Rose and Blue. He wasn't painting um, Cubis yet. And he, the brother said, hey, you need to buy this guy. He's going to be famous one day. And she looked at it and said, I don't like any of this. She told Picasso she thought his work sucked, but she bought like 20, I think 25 pictures the first time. Price, $5 a picture. So when people tell you that you can't get money, Victor said, tell me the story. So Martha Graham died in 46. Her family donated all those pictures to the Modern Museum of Art in New York. When I was a kid, I told you I saw them all. That's how I learned about all this from following all the rich kids around. That family now makes $55 million a year off of the royalties of those paintings that paid $5. I told Victor that story. And I told him, if I come back to Bernate and you sell that $100 of Bitcoin I gave you, because he did sell the 30 that Bukele gave him. And he was honest with me. And I and he said, dude, if I would have known this story, he goes, I would have never sold it. And I said, well, if you do, I'm going to come back. And, and he started to laugh. And it was a very powerful story. And, you know, he had tears in his eyes. And he said, you know, what can I do? I said, this is all I want you to do, bro. I said, I want you to go pay it forward. Tell other people in Salvador download the strike app, please go out and, and start saving in Bitcoin. Just do that. Tell them the story. And I, I try to explain to them that I'm like a candle with a flame on it. When I light your candle, it doesn't diminish my flame. And I want you to pass that to other people that are in your country so that they get the message of what's going on in Bitcoin Beach. So they get the message of what's going on, hopefully soon, with the volcano bonds down in Bay of Formosa and Bitcoin City. But I want the other side where I think light, water, and magnetism are optimized for my tribe up there. I think the mountains are it. Why? Because that's where the cold is. That's where the monk who sold his Ferrari, the mountain that Jack Mahler's talked about. I think I found the mountain, dude. I think this is where it's going to happen. So does that mean you're leaving the beach? No, it means I'm going to have to have another place, Mike. That's why you got to help me get a builder. <laughs> so what would you uh, say to people that are kind of like on the bubble, been thinking about coming down to El Salvador or been down here, but are, you know, finding all the practical reasons that they can't pick up and move? What, what would you say to them? Think about um, 1890, standing on 72nd and Broadway in New York with horse-drawn carriages going through and somebody offered you all four corners for a million dollars. But you saying, um, it's not safe enough here. I want to stay in Iowa and grow corn. And then realize today that that same corner is now worth about $6 billion. Or I'd say to the Americans, how about you open up your history book and go back to 1801 when Napoleon offered Thomas Jefferson the Louisiana Purchase. And we bought it for $12 million. One third of the United States was purchased for $12 million. Today, you can't buy one block in Louisiana for $12 million. People forget it goes from Louisiana all the way up to the border of Canada. The whole middle part where we feed the world, that's the land we got. That defines asymmetric investment. Okay, that's what Bitcoin is. That's what decentralized health is. That's what you want to do. That's what I try to explain to Victor, that anytime you get a deal that's like that, you can't lose. Anybody who listens to this in the United States, I would tell them shit or get off the pot. It is time to act. Ideation without execution leads to deletion of every good idea. If you have a good idea and you don't execute on it, the idea was worth nothing. You, need, you have a duty to yourself 
all the bad mojo that's going on with finances in the United States, all the bad mojo that just went on with COVID, to get on a plane, come down here, and prove Uncle Jack wrong. Prove me wrong that this isn't the place for you to be. Tell me this isn't the 14th colony run by somebody who's probably better than George Washington because he gets it. He gets it loud and clear. He's returning freedom back to the people. That's what all Americans love. This is the place where freedom is. No, you're gonna be safe here. You're not gonna get jumped in the street. You're not gonna have to look behind your back. Can you even get some of the, the cancer causing shit in El Salvador you get in the United States? Yeah, they have Wendy's and McDonald's here. They do, unfortunately. I don't want you to eat that crap, but if you do, you do. You, there's still creature comforts here. Will you see Porsche Cayennes? Will you see, I saw a Corvette, brand new Corvette the other day. I drive a Nissan Titan that I bought here. Don't think that every car is gonna be like a 1981 Nissan Sentra that's put together with sheetrock screws. That's not the way it is. Things are changing here. When you come to El Salvador, you're gonna see people living in shacks made out of galvanized stuff. But you're also gonna see people that smile because for the first time in their life, freedom is being returned to them. They don't need a bank because they have a phone. And they don't have to worry about the phone being taken from them because all the bad hombres are now in jail getting their freedoms taken away for being assholes by a guy who gets the way it should work. Not like the freaking criminals that we have in Washington, D.C. at home. So what would you say, you know, we hear a lot of criticism from people that, well, Bitcoin really hasn't made that much of a difference. There's, you can't use it a lot of places. You, you know, it's, what, what benefit has it really brought? Let's, let's have the economic story that I always bring to Clubhouse Bitcoin, because I know you're not there and you don't hear about it. So there's a couple of guys in there I'm going to call out. American Hoddle, John Ficori, Joe Carlosari. You'll learn about all these guys. They're going to hear about this and I know I'm going to catch shit for it. So for three years, they've been talking shit about El Salvador. So here we are three years later, and I'll explain to you why the premise you gave me is total bullshit. El Salvador has a GDP of $28 billion. Legal tender date was $43,000. Bitcoin has basically been below water for almost the whole time we've had legal tender status. Everybody agrees with that in the audience, right? Great. Yet, El Salvador is the only country in the world whose GDP has been grown double digits for the last three years consecutively. Ask yourself why. You, my friend, Paco, uh, Ramon, you're all part of that story, why? Because people like me started to come down here to see what's going on. And it turns out that Bukele just proved the last three years, Bitcoin doesn't have to be 100,000, 200,000, 400,000 for people to do well. And it works for people in El Salvador because American money hasn't blown up yet. They still need American money stability and not the volatility. But the big issue is, it's being returned in infrastructure. Your new airport is spectacular. The roads to get to the volcanoes now, they're no longer dirt roads. The, the colectivos no, are safe now. The biggest effect, Salvadorenos don't get popped for 300 bucks a month having to pay money to the bad hombres. That, you don't think that has an effect on inflation and personal? No, health? definitely it's, and, and I'm not sure about the statistics about it being double digits the last three years. There was a couple, I think one year it was in double digits, but I think compared to the rest of the world, yes, El Salvador is, is booming. Is booming. And you know, we see it here. You see construction, you see the, the complaints you hear from businesses is they have a hard time finding employees where it used to be, you know, rampant unemployment. So it's booming, but it's interesting. Nobody everybody says, Yeah, but it has nothing to do with Bitcoin. That has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Has everything like, to do with Bitcoin. You don't see all of the auxiliary and second order effects. All these people that are moving in because of Bitcoin, all of the businesses that are saw this signal that El Salvador is open for business, that has a forward looking administration. And so it's funny because they'll they'll make every argument in the world about why that isn't, you know, it isn't Bitcoin. So I'm wondering how long it's gonna take them before they finally, you know, give up the ghost and and realize that let's let's talk about the, the three guys I called out. So what was the big argument in Clubhouse Bitcoin? Well, 
you have debts here, IMF debts. And it looked like about a year and a half ago, you were going to default on them. You saw the swap rates go up and everybody was talking shit yeah. about that. And guess what happened? But what did Bukele do in one fell swoop? He paid off both of the IMF debts. You just saw your president tweet the other day, uh, JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon talking shit about El Salvador. And guess what? He just posted, he goes, I told you so. Yeah. So you got to realize something. All of this happened with Bitcoin not going to the moon. So the amount of dollars that have come in here for tourism have still supported his idea. The key to his agenda, the way I look at it as an outsider who's a smart guy, I think that they have to take the volcano bonds, put it on the national treasury. And this is what I told Giancarlo about Brunani. I'm telling you, telling everybody in this room, you think that the price of El Zante has gone through the roof? What do you think it's going to be the first time Bukele says, hey, by the way, we just added a 500 Bitcoin, this one, and we're going to add another 500 every quarter for the next five, six quarters. What is that going to do to the GDP? How, how is that going to affect land prices? Do you realize that that rising tide, the people that live in the galvanized shocks down the road from here, going to be a total game changer. And, and what I hope happens, and this is probably going to piss off a lot of Americans, and I'm going to say this, that Salvadorinos get really smart. And they say to Americans, we're not going to sell you our land. We're going to lease it to you. In other words, you're going to flip the script. You know, remember in America, we got that Louisiana purchase and nobody wanted to go to California, just like nobody wants to go to El Salvador until they found gold. Well, guess what? We got digital gold here. And once they realize when American money does blow up and guys like Victor, his money is worth more than people that live on Fifth Avenue now, because when they buy Bitcoin, they're not going to be able to afford the things here. Then the game's changed. And people think that this can't happen. I pointed out to Victor in, in 1890, there was um, galvanized shacks in Strawberry Fields in Central Park. I grew up in Central Park. My great great grandfather was a New York City Police Department um, uh, guy that was stationed down there. When I teach doctors about decentralized Bitcoin, I have a picture of the buildings on Central Park West with these shacks in Central Park, and I show them that it happened in the United States. If it happened in the United States, why can't it happen here? Tell me. Oh, I 100% think it's going to happen here. And I, I do think that, you know, anytime there's development and, and there's things that move in, there's, there's people that are left behind. And so that's, like you said, I hope it's the, the Salvadorans make sure that they own property here, that they're not pushed out. And as development happens, that it happens in a way that, it, that is inclusive um, because, you know, that's always a concern. But, well, it's but I definitely think this is going to be the best performing real estate in the world, hands down. I, I think so, too. But I also think the business opportunities of Salvadorians is going to be off the chart. Oh, Why? Yeah. Because when Americans come, they're lazy. They like creature conference. So I keep giving everybody ideas. I told my friend Jeremy two or three ideas that I said, you need to execute on this. And he's like, okay, I got it, bro. That's what he always tells me. And he writes it down in his little book, you know, and I give him these ideas, the things that will hit. But, you know, for your original question, people in America who don't know about this jewel, this is like coming to California in 1870. Uh, this is like coming to Hawaii in 1920. Um, this is like being in New York City in 1890. Um, it is spectacular. You'll love it. The people are here. There's a lot of Americans like me and you. Um, I, the, I, I, the things that I could say bad about this, they're bad only because I'm impatient. Um, I want what I want and I want it now because I'm an American. And that sometimes doesn't happen in El Salvador. But the thing is, the people here, the people I've made friends with, they are teaching me to be patient. I, I always use the story about a seed. The seed has to blow up and become a tree. And right now I'm in that own stage in El Salvador. I'm the seed and I look at it, you know, when you look at the world as a seed, it's a very devastating thing. You realize your whole life is going to be blown up. But eventually, 50 years from now, you're going to be a huge coconut tree and make coconuts for everybody. And there's a huge benefit there. 
Um, and many times I have to remind myself, like when I came in before the podcast and I told you I was frustrated, trust me, I have it under control because I see the bigger picture. I'm not going to be sidetracked by what the State Department says, what mainstream media says, what El Dario says about Bukele, or what the idiots on Twitter say about El Salvador and human rights or, you know, that guy Alex Gladstein, who I can't stand because I think he's done a disservice to this country. I understand he wants to be skeptical, just like you yeah. want to be skeptical. Well, I, I, I actually consider Alex a friend, and I, I think it's I, I think it's good to have people bring up the other things. I think the truth will will win in the end, and so I it think just that we have to It just bothers me that he doesn't give Bukele the credit that he deserves. Yeah, I think we need to get Alex down here and him to spend some more time on the ground. He came once, but I think he needs to return and see how much things have, have changed. I so. agree with you 100%. He, he actually owes... He's your friend. He owes you that duty, and he owes the people of Salvador that duty. Yeah. Well, where can people follow you? What's the the best way for them to get in contact with you if if they want to join your cult? Uh, what's the uh, what's what's the process? What's Easiest the... way is just put Doctor Jack Cruz in okay. the Google box, and you'll find tremendous amounts about me. I'm on every social media platform. If you want to read about more about some of the science we talked about here. I have a book on Amazon you can read. It's called, what's, what's the title? It's called The EpiPaleo RX. Okay. Uh, I also have a Patreon blog that teaches you in-depth science with all the sites so that you'll know that it's not BS. I've got at least five to 600 podcasts. Um, Which is the one that you did recently that you said kind of blew up and that the um, people should... It's Rick Rubin's new podcast. Rick is one of my patients as okay. well. And his new podcast is called Tetragrammaton. And he had Andrew Uberman, who's a PhD researcher at Stanford University. And he wanted me to talk to him about the same things you and I talked about for the same reason. He wants him to learn how to maybe teach medical students a little bit more in a decentralized fashion because it's going to be important. And obviously, that's what we need down in El Salvador, too. We need to teach the Salvadorian doctors, what decentralized truly means, you know, when it comes to biology. So the podcast is really long. It's that's one of the things that unfortunately most people don't like. Uh, it's in two parts. The first part was four hours. The second part's two hours. But everybody who's actually persistent and, and read it, it's been wildly successful. It's kind of made me uh, too popular, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, most of the people that want to talk to me are on the biology side. This has been a pleasure to come, you know, meet you in my old house. Um, <laughs> but to talk a little Bitcoin, why? Because the Bitcoin community is still really scared of Jack Cruz. And the reason why they're scared of me is because I'm calling them out. It's not good enough to be wealthy in Bitcoin and not be wealthy in your health. You have to reject Steve Jobs' story. I don't want people to be really wealthy, but not healthy. And... Um, I think it's much more easy to live this lifestyle in a place like El Salvador than it will to be in a place in the United States. And I think there's going to be more support here for my tribe because the resonance here, and when I say resonance, I mean the vibration is here. All you have to do is go on the beach in El Zante and see those guys surfing, see that crazy son of a bitch on that little boogie board. And you just realize this is the place I want to be. If that guy's 50 years old and can do this, I know that I can get better here. I know that this is my place. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, I guess I finish it up with one cool last story. I have a, a farm member. This is a client who's a patient of mine who came down to El Salvador. He's thinking about relocating from California. He got pretty sick down here and he had to have a surgery down here. The doctor from El Salvador called me up, kept me apprised of everything. He had a surgery done, did well, went home. He's currently now back in El Salvador, staying in Atami, uh, had a great uh, outcome. So for people who are worried that the healthcare here is not good, not only is it pretty good, but it's also cheap. And this surgery that he had done cost him less than I think 500 bucks. The same surgery in the United States, I did the calculations, close to $75,000. So 
So that should allay no, some fear. I, I would much rather deal with medical issues in El Salvador than, than the U.S. I just feel like the doctors spend a lot more time with you here. You That's just the everything about the care is much better than the kind of push you through in the U S and then stick you with a big bill on the other end. So I agree. I, I would, I mean, I, I know people that are in the U S but they'll fly down here to get their medical care because they just prefer to have it done here. So if that's your worry, you know, definitely. Uh, I it's would not, not a, it's yeah. not a big worry. Yeah. We just need more doctors. Do you know, and I'm just curious for, for people in the medical profession that, that maybe want to get out of the U.S. that don't like the direction it's going, is how hard is it for them to transfer their licenses and to, to practice here? Have you looked into that at all? Yeah, I have. And that's actually one of the things that I'm going to be talking about with the Bukele administration in the next five, six days. Okay. In fact, uh, yesterday on the Q&A uh, that I did for my members, we had a, a girl from Canada, British Columbia, her name's R uh, Raquel, and she's an anesthesiologist. She's been sidetracked by COVID. Uh, because she wouldn't take the jab, so they wouldn't let her work. So she hasn't worked in two years. So now she's going to the Maldives to do little locums work, you know, over there so she can get some money. Mm -hmm. So she spent a lot of time with me on the on the Q&A yesterday asking this very issue. And I told her exactly what I'm telling you. This is one of the topics that Uncle Jack wants to talk to Bukele about. Because if you remember, Mike, in Miami, when uh, Jack Mauler was on stage, he said, I didn't want to pay for that damn license that you have to pay for in the United States. Well, the flip side is, if you're going to offer things to Danish farmers, why wouldn't you offer the same thing to American doctors that are certified? Because we can literally start taking care of all the surfers right now. If they need something done, you know, they need, from what I understand, I mean, Roman's the one that told me this. There's only four neurosurgeons in the whole country of El Salvador. And three, three are active, one's retired. So, dude, I have no problem drilling holes. All I need uh, is the okay to do it. Yeah, I, I, I'd be more than happy, you know, to do stuff like that. I mean, it's easy here because why? Pay me in f shitty fiat money, and I can convert it to Chiba wallet at the Hope House. Well, I think there's a lot of people in the medical community that would love to to relocate, but a lot of them feel hamstrung because you know they have debts that they're paying off from their education and, and they can't practice in other places. But if that was opened up to them, well, I really think that that would. I think that'll help. But the other thing that you could do, Mike, you can do locums work. Remember, you can you can work one week a month in the United States, but live here. Then you could take that fiat money and you, I, I wanna make sure, cause this is a good, this is another good point about decentralized medicine. This is how you play both sides of the fence. Take your American money and come down here, put it in Bitcoin, save some of it, but you live here. It's cheaper and you just, it's brain drain for the United States. You go do what you have to do back there, but you can live here. And how do you pay your debts off? Anybody in this room think Bitcoin's going to stay at 30,000 for the next, you know, 50 years? Or do we think it's going up? So guess what? If you take that locum's money and you buy Bitcoin, Guess what? Bukele may help you pay off your loans faster so you can say to the United States. No, definitely. And I think we, we're seeing people do that already. But for a lot of people, they just have this fear of, of actually making Mike, that move. you're so. sitting next to somebody who's doing it. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you, do I look scared? No, but you're, but, but you're, a, little, you're a little crazier than most. So, <laughs> no, I, trust me, I say this as somebody who bought a house here 20 years ago. I, I, but from talking to people back home, these are things I hear all the time. So, uh, but I agree. I think it's going to become more and more apparent to them that the biggest risk is not making the move. And so I think that's opportunity what costs. Them. Yeah. You're right. I think that is the take home message. And I hope some of the young Bitcoiners that do have money come down here and they actually you know, reinvest, you know, yeah. kind of like you've done here at Bitcoin Beach, the things that, you know, Roman's done, you know, with teaching people that that paid forward thing needs to happen. And I just think the community here, it's it's all in place for it to happen. All we need is the fuse to get lit. And I personally think the fuse that's going to get lit is probably the happening when it comes up and Bitcoin starts moving and Salvadorians begin to realize that that $30 would have been worth 200 
if they didn't sell it, they're going to go, wait a minute. Yeah. And I think that's going to change the game a little bit. And when they begin to understand more about what's happening really in America, because I know a lot of people don't realize things are getting really bad in America on the finance side, especially in the last year. And I expect that to accelerate the next year. Um, I think the Bitcoin story is going to become more powerful. Why? Because guys like you, guys like me, guys like Paco, guys like Ramon, we're not going to have to sell the Bitcoin story because it's going to sell itself. Definitely. Well, I think that's a good note to close on. I appreciate you coming down and I'm going to start putting some of these health things into practice, get back out in the water. No problem. And hopefully next time I see you, I'll be tanner than you are. Good. I love to hear it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Jack.